Well, good morning and welcome to all of you and welcome also to everyone who's joining us via live stream. We are so pleased to see you here this morning on a steamy summer day. You know, 1939 was a dark year for the whole world, but it was especially dark for the country of Poland. In October of that year, the nation fell to the Nazis, and soon after, Hitler's troops proceeded systematically to corral all Jewish Polish citizens into ghettos. From there, the captive Jews were forced into camps, and many of those prisoners were compelled to labor in factories that supplied the war effort. One such factory was acquired that same year by a German citizen, a member of the Nazi party, named Oskar Schindler. Now his name probably rings a bell for many of you. It was made famous in the 1993 uh, Steven Spielberg blockbuster movie, Schindler's List. And if you saw that movie, you may also recall that Oskar Schindler was no saint. <laughs> He was almost certainly a collaborator with the Abwehr, German intelligence. He cheated nearly continually on his wife. He drank heavily, he threw lavish parties, and was never shy about offering a bribe. And he acquired that company, that factory that I mentioned, quite opportunistically. You see, it had been seized from its previous Jewish owners, and it was given to Schindler during the occupation. Now, he took on the factory, not so much because he supported the Nazi vision, but rather to fund his lavish lifestyle and to avoid being drafted into the military. Not long after Schindler set up business, he got word that using free Jewish labor could improve his bottom line. So he proceeded to populate his assembly lines with Jewish prisoners. But Something happened along the way to Oskar Schindler. We don't really know if he had a dramatic moment of epiphany, but what we do know is that in 1943, Schindler did something unusual and noteworthy. He built a special sub-camp for his workers right on his factory property. Now, in practical terms, what this meant was the Jews who worked for Schindler were no longer subject to forced marches back and forth to the Platzau concentration camp. Instead, in Schindler's camp, the workers had clean, decent bedding. Families were allowed to remain together instead of being separated at night. The food they ate was far better than anything the Nazis provided. And while SS officers were still perched on perimeter watchtowers, soldiers were forbidden from entering the factory camp itself. Here's what Rena Findler, who came to Schindler's factory as a 13-year-old girl, remembered about him. She said, it felt like he took care of us. He'd smile and ask how you are and pat you on the head. Once she had trouble with the machine to the point that the machine broke. She said, I was crying and so scared. The foreman accused me of sabotage, she recalls. Schindler said, a small girl can't handle this machine. Nobody but a man should be using this machine. I was convinced, she said, he was sent from heaven. Now in 1944, as the Russian army advanced, the Nazis relocated many Polish factories further west. Schindler's factory was moved to a small town in today's Czech Republic. And that's when Schindler's list was drawn up. It named line by line every Jewish worker who would be moved to the new factory under Schindler's protection. He carried on as if it was all business, but truthfully, Schindler had come to care and have compassion for these men and women, and he did what he could to preserve their lives without raising too much suspicion. All in all, under Schindler's authority, over a thousand prisoners, men, women, and children who otherwise faced certain death, were saved. 
Now in this morning's gospel passage, we listened as a Jewish expert in the law made a big show of asking Jesus, a popular young rabbi, how he could inherit eternal life. And in response to his question, Jesus simply affirmed what everyone knew the law taught. Love God. Love your neighbor. Simple enough. Next question. Well, then, who is my neighbor, the young lawyer continued. I think a little miffed that Jesus' retort made his question seem kind of simplistic. And Jesus, true to form, answered with a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, he said, and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now in Jesus' day, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was notoriously dangerous. It was a 17-mile stretch of rocky ground surrounded by natural caves that were populated by robbers and other criminals. So it was not surprising that the subject of Jesus' story had taken a terrible beating there. But you remember what happened next in the story. First, a priest came by. Next, a Levite. Both these fellow travelers would have known the righteous demands of the law, but they just kept going. Both knew that love for neighbor and care for those in need was an intrinsic part of God's commands. But both also knew that according to the law, touching a corpse would render them unclean and land them for at least a week in a kind of purification ritual quarantine, keeping them from their very important work at the temple. And what's more, they both had a practical understanding that stopping in the ancient equivalent of a gritty inner city might land them in exactly the same place as that poor fellow there lying in the gutter. So they just kept going. But then along came a Samaritan. Now, to Jews in Jesus' day, Samaritans were despised. They practiced what many saw as a corrupt form of Judaism that claimed its own version of the Torah and its own center of worship that was not in Jerusalem. So when Jesus told this young lawyer that a Samaritan, a man that Jews believed was actually engaged in the most corrupt form of Judaism, was the only one who obeyed God's command to love his neighbor, that Jesus lifted this man up as an example, well, it was outrageous, scandalous, completely upside down. It was kind of like saying that Oscar Schindler, member of the Nazi party, thoroughly self-absorbed, self-serving, and opportunistic, actually became a savior to over a thousand Jewish prisoners. Well, it turns logic on its head. But Jesus asks us to take notice and do likewise. You see, friends, we do well to remember that any righteousness that we have is not a result of ticking off boxes on some kind of behavioral checklist. It's not about keeping up appearances or doing everything perfectly. We don't earn eternal life by following a set of rules, even good ones. No, the good news of our faith is that our righteousness is given to us in Christ as a gift, that God is quicker to forgive than we are to ask, that the Holy Spirit indwells each of us and guides and strengthens us and makes us more like Christ every day. Now, this doesn't mean that morality or good behavior is meaningless. Of course not. But friends, Christ Jesus sets us free to love God and love our neighbor with abandon. The compassion we receive is intended to overflow into compassion for others. And loving others well 
not just the people we like or loving when it feels safe or is easy, and especially when we love those in great need like that Good Samaritan did. Well, it's then that we most resemble our Heavenly Father and fulfill the Law and the Prophets. So friends, together, let's learn to love well. Let's love like Oscar Schindler, like that Samaritan on the road. Let's learn to love by supporting the ministries of this parish church, like our port ministry that we'll talk about in just a little bit. Let's learn to love like Jesus loves and inherit his eternal life.